I took the podcast on the road to the first robotics competition. This incredible organization brings together a vibrant community of kids ages 4 to 18, fostering their passion for science and technology through team-based robotics programs. On this episode of Forging the Future, I had a chance to talk with Logan Farrell, Greg Needell, and Andy Baker, just some of the incredible robotics companies and partners forging the future. Let's check it out. Welcome to another episode of Forging the Future. And we're up here at the first robotics competition with Logan Farrell. Logan is the co-founder and CTO of Rugged Robotics and happens to be a soft tech client. So uh, thanks for coming on, Logan. Yeah, of course, my pleasure. So you uh, actually started your engineering career with FIRST. I right? did. In high school, actually, uh, yep. right? You know, so tell me a little bit about what attracted you to FIRST at that point in time in high school. Um, I really just stumbled into it. My mm -hmm. high school started a team in 2006. I was a freshman in high school. I wanted to do engineering things. I don't even know who turned me on to it, but uh, <laughs> Four years later, I left high school thinking, I'm gonna build sweet robots for a job. And like that, it set me on the career path that I got to. I had amazing mentors on the way um, who really set me up for success. What kind of mentors were those? Um, so at our uh, program was through Purdue. Mm -hmm. So we actually had Purdue college students who were ex-firsters in high schools themselves. Um, and it was a great group of, of folks. A lot of them are still mentoring. One I'm still really good friends with. Uh, but she taught me a lot about how to solve problems. Uh, her adage was always, okay, what are we going to do about it? Um, which is something I've tried to take on from then. Uh, but really just people with passion to teach the next generation on how to build robots. Yeah. So um, it had a pretty positive impact if you decided to go <laughs> into a career of robotics. Yeah. So, um you think it really did help prepare you for that? It did. Before uh, that, I was thinking, oh, I'm going to do architecture or some kind of science. And I really left thinking, like, I want to build robots. I'm going to mm. start with mechanical engineering. I like getting my hands dirty. I like software. I like just the whole concept of building something and seeing it work in the world. Mm -hmm. um, writing software for a back end, you know, API client for a web server not interesting to me, writing a control scheme and watching the wheel freak out and trying to tune that in so it behaves nicely. Like that's what really got me excited in that high school phase and that's kicked me off. How big was your team at that point in high We school? had about 25, 30 students. Mm -hmm. um, we, you know, it was kind of a group of four of us from my freshman year all the way up through. Uh, and it was interesting, like a lot of leadership opportunity too. I was team captain for a bit, you know, I was on the drive crew for a while. Uh, learned a lot about how to lead other people. Um, and I look back and laugh because I did it very poorly, uh, but I learned a lot in the process, which is part of the point. You've got that adult leadership to help you not make huge mistakes, but let you make some so that you can learn from it. Yeah, I think that's one interesting thing that I've learned. First, that the teams are so big, like 25 to 30 students. Mm -hmm. Also, that they actually take a role-based approach where they do divide the tasks up and it's not like for four years you were doing firmware for the robot, right? right? You actually got to try on the hat of several different roles on mm -hmm. the team, including a leader. Yep. Um, just super impactful. I remember uh, in high school, and actually it was in elementary school, they had a school newspaper and sixth grade class uh, students produced the paper and for whatever reason I decided to throw my hat in the ring <laughs> for editor Yeah, and I actually got it right and so uh, it was probably one of the first times that I kind of went outside my box and decided I wanted to actually lead mm -hmm. you know and um, you know the opportunity to do that in a school setting for the first time rather than at it work right you know is uh, I think very impactful um, and so you, uh, you did the high school program mm -hmm. and then you went on to mentor as well. Was that while you were in college or? So um, partially, um, out straight out of high school, mm -hmm. uh, went, got my degree at the university of Illinois and I had the opportunity while there to co-op for NASA at the mm -hmm. Johnson space center with their robotics group. Oh yeah, that's right. We have a shared history with that. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and that, you know, was kind of the next step in my robotics career. And they sponsor Team 118. So while in high school, or excuse me, while in college, I was able to mentor uh, through my work experience there. So I mentored the 2012 team. 
uh, and then came back full time and then mentored 118 from 2014 through about 2019, 2018, 19 uh, with 118. Why did you come back to mentor? The mentors who mentored me are the reason that I got the start that I did um, mm -hmm. and led to a lot of my success, like really set me up well. And I wanted to do that same thing for other students, like mm -hmm. to, to give that knowledge back, to inspire the next generation, uh, just to pay it forward. Because it is a volunteering It position, is, yeah. Right? And it is a lot of time. Mm -hmm. Like the mentors, the volunteers here at the competition, they're here before students come and after they leave and the day before and the day after. The mentors are there every night. Um, usually three, four nights a week, all day on Saturday for six, eight, 12 weeks at a time. Like it is a massive commitment, um, but it's, I mean, it's like coaching football, mm -hmm. except you're building a robot instead. Do you, uh, can anyone apply to be a mentor? Yes, uh, really, they, anybody can be a mentor. It's not just software developers and mechanical engineers. There's a lot of other aspects to FIRST. There's a lot of outreach programs and you know, business plans and getting new sponsors. Um, so there are a lot of non-technical roles that teams need filled, even just logistics. And anybody can do logistics. If you just want to help out, you can come coordinate meals and buses. Like mm. Teams need that just as much as they need somebody to help you know, figure out the stress on this part. Mm. I think that's an interesting component to me and just how well spoken so many of these students are all the way down to like, you know, grade school level on up, mm -hmm. right? You know, so it, it seems to be working. Yeah, because uh, part of what they, they focus on the people, not the robots. Like, mm -hmm. yes, the, what you built is a robot, but it's, it's kids competing behind us, mm -hmm. not robots. And it's every part of that. It's, um, there's lots of different awards that the students can go win and you have to figure out how to talk and how, you know, on my team in high school, we had a few people who talked to judges uh, because they were good at it and a few people who talked to judges because they weren't good at it. And it was a good chance for them to, to learn something new. Mm. And are you still volunteering? I do still volunteer, yeah, with uh, Rugged Robotics. I left NASA 2019 to go start Rugged Robotics. And um, a fledgling company, a fledgling family did not leave a lot of time for mentoring. But I still try and volunteer at the local competitions as much as I can. Uh, to just keep in, engaged in the community. And I'd love to come back and mentor once Rugged is its own thriving, self-sufficient uh, beast, which we're getting close to. Yeah, I want to talk a little bit more about that. What I found interesting is how many alumni are at your startup. Yeah. And uh, you have eight alumni at your company. Eight out of the 30 of us uh, mm. had first experience. Um, some That's of us amazing. played robots together in high school. Actually, one of our my uh, coworkers, he and I were on s similar teams in Lafayette, Indiana. Mm -hmm. um, two of us were on Mentored 118 together. A few were students that we mentored uh, or that we were tangentially mentored through other teams. Um, so it's a great program. And it's wonderful because those kids have built something. One of the things that we value in recruiting is having actually built a physical thing because you don't understand the complexities of hardware because hardware is hard. And when you do only simulation and then you get to the real robot, you have to learn that, that step of, is it my motor? Is it my motor driver electronics or the software that I push to it? Because it can be any one of those three things. You can't really learn that troubleshooting experience until you've done it. And these high school kids, they've done it four times already mm. um, with their machines that they're building here. That is interesting. So it's actually even a networking uh, association, right? So you can, there's alumni, there's relationships, it's something you actually carry forward with you into your career. Yeah, like I've had, uh, I've seen resumes and I see first on it and I'll reach out to the their head mentor who I know and be like, mm. hey, this person XYZ good? Like, oh yeah, they were one of our best. Like, great. I don't even read the rest of the resume. Mm -hmm. That text message like gets them the interview and starts that process. Or we've had people like, hey, this person was awesome. They're looking for an internship. You should talk to them. Um, and that's, it's mentors helping students find those opportunities because that's really their goal is to place them in the next step of their lives. Uh, and a lot of mentors take that very, very seriously. Yeah, I like Dean's uh, tagline of every student can go pro. Yes. Right? And I think that I'm, I'm seeing that to be true. Yeah. It's not just a marketing message. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like the first culture has influenced your own culture at your startup? I think so. It's the rapid development, teamwork, interdisciplinary approach uh, is very true with how we develop hardware. You got to do it fast and quick. Um, understand what what to spend time on and what not to. Um, especially in the classic first days when I first uh, started 
d participating in first. We had ship day. Mm -hmm. You had six weeks to build the robot, and then FedEx or UPS showed up, and your robot had to be in its crate, and they shipped it away from you. Mm. You only had the six weeks to build the robot. And now that's still somewhat true, is you have about seven to eight weeks before your first competition, the robot's got to be ready then. It's still such a tight time window. You just have to learn how to develop fast, develop right, and solve problems quickly. Um, and the mentors really need to foresee problems. And there's some cases where you shortcut a problem and say, hey, maybe this won't work. And sometimes you let the students figure out that it's not going to work uh, because that's literally the point. I think it is an interesting thing that it really does prepare you for startup life. Yeah, right? yeah it does. Because <laughs> so, that's exactly that. How do we get our POC built? How do we get an MVP? How do we test this? How do we move fast and break things, right? Yep. And you have deadlines. Yep. Right? So. And even how do you raise money? Mm. How do you get money for the team? How do you get money for the company? How Did, do, you... do you feel that first helped you in that in the raising money component part of that? I think so, because it helps me figure out how to explain things well. Mm -hmm. um, explaining complicated topics to people who don't understand it. You know, when somebody's grandma comes by to check out the robot, you have to use different language than you use when you're talking about it with a seasoned engineer. And like the fundraising process is very similar. You start at a high level trying to explain something very complicated in a way that they'll understand and then get to the meat of what they're interested in. Dive mm. down as deep as they want to go in the areas they want to. And I think really my first years in, in FIRST helped me learn those skills that I still use for that process. So tell me a little bit about the decision to go off on your own and start a company because you were working, mm -hmm. right? And then you took the red pill. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, what, what was that like? What, what motivated you to do that? Um, it was a few things. So I'd been at NASA for about eight years mm -hmm. um, and I loved the work I did at NASA. I loved the people there. It was fun. It was cool. We built really sweet stuff. Um, but it was 15 year out type technology and kind of taking a step back, I did one internship with a medical device company where I worked on a large gauge muscle biopsy needle that was going to help people solve the problem of urethral incontinence. Mm -hmm. And I took a ton of self-satisfaction in that project because I had such an obvious impact to the world. Mm -hmm. The stuff I did at NASA did, does have an impact, I just don't know what it is. The, my developments are gonna be some little piece of some larger piece of that mm -hmm. you know, research train that yields results. So part of it was the ability to go solve a problem people have on planet Earth today. Um, and the second was, you know, NASA is a large government agency. I realized that I can't affect change in that system. If something doesn't work like I want it to, there's nothing I can do about it. So it was also intriguing to go set up a company with a culture that I value, um, with a, a work-life balance and kind of focus that I care about. And that company is Rugged Robotics. Rugged Robotics, yes. And what does it do? So we are uh, construction automation. It's really automation for commercial construction. Mm -hmm. Our first product is solving the problem of field layout. Um, so that is in, in this room, we've got a bunch of drywall, HVAC ducts, sprinklers, switches, lights. There's a model for that. And the way that it actually gets built is this, this floor started as a concrete slab. And some guys with paper drawings, tape measures, chalk lines, and Sharpies drew on the floor for where their crew needed to build that stuff. Uh, it's error prone, it's slow, and it's a problem that can be solved with robots. So that's, that's really what we're focusing on right now. And actually a challenging one. I mean, yes. it, on the surface, it sounds like, well, okay, the robot draws the chalk line on the concrete and, you know, that kind of printing has been around for, a, you know, type of printing has been yeah. around for a while, but there's a level of accuracy exactly. right, that's a challenge. So right, that so. on an indoor commercial construction, we're talking, you know, high rise office buildings, strip malls, like high rise residential, that, those hospitals, those types of buildings, you know, they're looking for an eighth inch or better accuracy across a 40,000 square foot floor plate. Mm. Um, and the only things that can do that right now are robotic total stations, you know, Trimble, Hilti, Leica, and the type. And they're not set up to do this. And we've basically built kind of a robotic total station on a mobile base that drives around and positions itself on that floor. So you're right. The, the hard part is GPS denied environment plus minus eighth inch go. That's the magic. Yeah, because GPS certainly doesn't have that level of accuracy, right? It does if you set up an RTK station. So mm -hmm. a lot of outdoor uh, precision, they'll set up a base station that you can site in way more accurately. Mm -hmm. And then... Uh, so I use your robot to talk to that RTK base station and get really eighth inch accuracy, but you have to have that line to the sky. 
Yeah, I mean, I think it's really important to build and cultivate uh, the talent pipeline, and it sounds yeah. like FIRST is definitely doing that. Plus, you're hiring people that were involved in FIRST. Do you see internships as like a piece of that uh, puzzle? Um, would you, does FIRST have a mentorship, uh, an internship program at all yet? Yeah, probably not. So FIRST- they're in high school, right? So it's right. Like, yeah. So. Um, so first doesn't necessarily, there are some programs that do cater towards, you know, like high school seniors who have been in the first program. Um, I know of a couple around and they're great, awesome opportunities, uh, usually run by companies with a lot of first alumni in them. Mm-hmm. But really it's, it's once you get to college, the first on the resume is something to leverage. Uh, it's one of the few things I recommend to students to leave on their college resume for a while. Um, potentially all the way through senior year, even if it's just a line at the very bottom, because you'll get a first alum like me and go, oh, they haven't been doing engineering for four years. They've been doing it for eight. Yeah. So I can talk about some of those experiences. Um, so it's it's really that key indicator for a lot of employers. Like I said, when I see in first on a resume, when I'm going through, like I reviewed uh, 1,300 resumes for our software internship position this summer. and. To be frank, I go through them at about a resume every 15 seconds. Mm -hmm. It is fast. I look for key phrases. And First Robotics on there is one that will almost automatically kick into the next step. It checks the box. It checks the box. So it's- I do something similar. I mean, obviously, having run businesses for 35 plus years, it's it's very powerful when you find a candidate and you find out like that they actually have written programs since they were eight, 10, 12 years old, that they think programming is fun or Mm -hmm. um, have been involved like with FIRST doing hardware, hardware development. They've done things where they weren't necessarily told to do, right, you know? And that they have a passion for it. And it's not just like, oh, uh, they don't, you know, maybe they don't have their degree yet, Mm -hmm. but they also have 10 years of experience already. Yeah. You know, and actually working on real projects. Exactly. um, and yeah, when, I can see how that would really definitely be a, a plus, something to leave on there. And so talk a little bit about your role as CTO at the company. What exactly does a CTO do at a robotics company? So I'm responsible for the technology, mm-hmm. um, kind of short and sweet there. So our company right now is about 20 um, people are technology focused, about 10 are um, sales and execution focused. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I'm responsible for those 20 and it's really now I'm doing less, I'm doing almost no writing of code or turning of wrenches. Uh, It is mostly helping other people make decisions. Um, I'd say 50% of my job is priority setting. 40% of my job is looking towards the future. And 10% is the other 100% that I have to do. Yeah. (laughs) Do you miss that part? Because I always feel like every every step up in a manager role, I feel like was one more lobotomy. (laughs) Yes. I... um, I do miss parts of it. I miss writing code. Um, I do still dive in to help solve technical problems at times as I'm not removed enough yet that I'm not still useful. But I, I can see where that, I can see it on the horizon. But it's been very satisfying to like watch something that I help build grow. It's kind of like when you built a robot um, or these high school kids build a robot and they see it out on the field. For me, originally it was our prototype robots and then it was the robot fleet. And now it's it's the people building the robots mm-hmm. is what I'm like proud of what we've built. I'm proud of the culture, the attracted, the talent that we've attracted, the quality of just the human beings. And like I'm I'm proud of the humans in the room and the robots are a nice byproduct. So what's next for rugged robotics? Yeah, so really now we're focusing on sales and execution. We're we're growing, we have robots to do the job for customers. So now it's how do we do that job better, faster, and serve those customers' needs? Um, Because one of the interesting things about our business is we're robotics as a service. Mm -hmm. We're really a layout company that happens to do layout faster and more accurately because we have a robot Mm -hmm. uh, versus our competition is leasing or selling the robots. Um, So really, we need to stand up that operations force. We have an operations team of six now. That needs to go to 12. We're... um, we're flying around the country with the machines and we can do projects anywhere, uh, but that is an inexpen- er, an expensive and time consuming way to do business. So starting to you know go into other markets, how do we stand up satellite offices? How do we kind of build that sales pipeline, attract those customers and really make satisfy those customers. So it's not just getting the customer, but making sure that the operations team delivers for the customer, setting up that fleet management. So it's that, 
that next phase of we're not building a robot or a robot fleet. We're building a company, mm. an actual viable company that can go out and service the customer's needs. Lots of challenges ahead, but um, exciting to watch you grow your business. Thank That's you. Yeah, I mean, you guys helped us in the early days with mm. some some of that work that got our first robots going, and yeah, you know, it helped us get to where we are. So yeah. we appreciate y'all. Sure, absolutely. Well, Logan, thanks for being on the podcast. I have a little bag for you. Oh boy! I've got my first robotic socks on today. <laughs> you might find some robot socks in there Excellent. as well. Excellent. So. Oh, thank you so yeah, much. Sure. I appreciate it. All right. Thank you. We're here at the first World Championships with Greg Needell from the CEO of Rev Robotics. Thanks for coming on the show, Greg. Yeah, thanks for having me, Chris. Good to see you again. So you've been involved with FIRST from when? Uh, so this will be my 23rd FRC, or first season, mm. and I was a high school student on a team way, way back. Nice. Was that here in Texas? No, or? so I, I grew up in Baltimore, Maryland, okay. and... Um, and I helped start my team when I was a high schooler, and I've been involved with FIRST ever since. You know, I involved as a FIRST participant, and then when I graduated, um, I went to RIT. We helped start a bunch of teams in the Rochester region, uh, mentor, volunteer, kind of done a lot with FIRST. It's, a, it's an incredible organization, and um, I'm happy to, uh, you know, dedicate myself so that every kid everywhere has an opportunity to participate in it. You think about back 23 years, you know, what first attracted you to first? Well, I think 23 years ago, um, you know, back then, you know, uh, BattleBots was on TV. You know, I remember very vividly wanting to get skills to actually go participate in those competitions. And first was something that I stumbled on randomly. My high school participated in solar car competitions. It's similar format to this. High school's building cool stuff. Mm -hmm. But uh, first is amazing in the way that it, every team gets to kind of sculpt the way that they participate. Every student gets to explore what they're interested in. So if you, because when I, when I was in high school, I knew I was going to be an engineer. That was probably pre god conclusion for, you know, long before that. But I didn't know, did I want to do electronics or, or did I want to do mechanical? And so first allowed me to explore that. And then really the community of people kept me involved. Because mm. you've actually gone through and checked all the boxes, right? Because you've been a student. Yep. Then you've been, you were a mentor, you said. Yep. And then uh, also a sponsor. Yep. So now, uh, yeah, so. And a supplier, but we'll get supplier. to that in a minute. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm. But uh, it's, it's basically everything, and, and I didn't plan this, right? But it's everything that's kind of happened in my career has been first related somehow, right? So. I went to RIT because people who I met in first, we all went to RIT together. We all mentored teams together. Uh, my first job out of college, I worked for Black and & Decker. And, and I, you co-opted at DECA and too? I, and I co-opted and I worked at DECA. <laughs> Dean, um, Dean came and his Dean, company. Yeah, yeah, Dean's company. And so mm -hmm. all these different internships, co-ops, jobs have been somehow related, right? It's always, it's never like the plan, but first helped me build this amazing network of friends, but also professional relationships. and then. My career has kind of pathway journeyed as a result. So you mentioned it was a foregone conclusion that you were going to be an engineer. I mean, how did you first become interested in engineering? So my dad owned a mechanical contracting business, air conditioning, heating. I was on job sites growing up. Um, I was always, my dad would always bring things home. I would take things apart, try to figure them out. You were that kid. I was that kid <laughs> where, uh, you know, they started to have to bring me things home because if they wanted to keep uh, actually functioning appliances in the house. They needed to give me something that I could take apart. Um, so interested in engineering. I, I think that early on it was just I had a knack for how things worked and I was very curious about doing things. And engineering was something that came naturally. But I, I mean, I think early on maybe I was thinking about construction and skilled trades, building and creating, because it's really the creative process that gets me going. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And so after going through this, all these programs and different levels at first, you actually decided to take the plunge yourself and become a startup founder. Yep. Right? Tell me a little bit about that decision. Sure. So um, I was working for companies doing product development. Um, I, took, I took a break, kind of a left turn in my career about 
I guess it would have been like 10 years ago now. And I went to work for Southern Methodist University. Mm -hmm. And I was their director of their innovation gym um, on campus. I did innovation programs, their maker spaces. And I had to do a little bit of research while I was there. I, you know, universities, you know, encourage that type of thing. Right. So I started to research, um, you know, this first and why we were only in, you know, 10% of schools because 10 years prior to that, we hadn't hit technology ubiquity like we have right now where it was, you know, this moment, yeah, obviously in this room, but even on the street right now, you could ask a random person about a Raspberry Pi or an Arduino. Everybody's got a cell phone in their pocket. Everybody's constantly connected. Well, how come this hadn't exploded at the same rate that technology had entered our lives? And so ultimately I did a bunch of exploratory there and I bucketized this into it's the cost of the program and the materials, the, the lack of professional development for teachers to retrain them on new subject matter, and then the political nature of the uh, you know, school systems in general. And when I started to, that became kind of apparent, I realized that you know, maybe I should do something about it. I, I'm, I'm not a politician, um, but I know about products, and so, when we looked at the product landscape of what existed, there's this traditional thing that happens with many uh, educational specific companies, the most common ones being textbook companies where they try to maximize revenue in their small markets. But I'm looking at the world saying there's millions and millions of kids that don't have access to this stuff because of the cost of the program. So if those buckets that I talked about actually are dominoes, if we could design a new robotics system that is lower cost, maybe we make one domino fall, we do new, uh, new professional development or training materials, that domino falls, and then more kids get access to it. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of the rev journey is the identifying that. And then my partner and I, uh, we actually met, we're both coaching our first robotics teams, got to know each other through mutual friends, but he was an electrical engineer, I was a mechanical engineer, and that's kind of, a pretty traditional matchup of uh, startup companies. And at the beginning, we just had a vision of what we were trying to do. And now here we are almost nine years later and we've got students in over 10,000 schools globally using our products, mm. not just inside of FIRST, but outside of it and in the classroom and beyond. Yeah. Uh, do you feel like your experience with FIRST, both on the robotics teams and as a mentor, prepared you to be an entrepreneur? I think it absolutely does. Um, all of these robotics teams function as little microcosm businesses, right? So the robot itself is the product. You have marketing teams, you've got alliances, you've got to market yourself not just to other robotics teams, but to get sponsors, talking to other businesses. Um, and you have to learn about different varieties. There's supply chain things. There's dealing with different personalities and group dynamics. There's money management. I mean, every single robotics team that participates in this program is, in some regard, a small startup business. Mm. And so I think that being involved with that for so many years, I learned a lot of those lessons that I definitely uh, put in place. We also made a lot of mistakes, but like it's we uh, we felt like we were more prepared than if I had not been involved in these programs. Well, I think that approach to making mistakes and then learning from them and iterating, super important, right? And I yeah. think that that's something the kids all get here yeah. as well I, at first. And yeah. as an entrepreneur, it's something you're constantly having to do. One more problem that you have to solve, another one gets stood up, you gotta knock that one down. Right. And mm -hmm. I, th I think the big thing is to, uh, is to fail often um, try to fail small instead of big, right? Mm -hmm. uh, controlling the, controlling how big of the risk mitigation it is. And I, I mean, I remember when we turned the corner as a company where I was like, all right, if this doesn't work out, we're not gonna go under, right? Because mm -hmm. that, that's one of the hardest things is that when we're early on, and I think this is pretty standard amongst a lot of startups, sometimes there's that, that big customer, that big product decision, that big thing. And it's like, you're shooting for the fences and if it doesn't go 80% the way you think it is, you might not be there tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And so we, we did that. So I remember when I was like, oh, we can make this decision. If it doesn't go right, it's all right. Yeah. But um, I like to say inside uh, Rev, um, we're all about making new mistakes. So 
I'm totally fine. Everybody makes mistakes. We make mistakes as a company. I make mistakes. Employees make mistakes. But my whole thing is we need to make new mistakes. Mm -hmm. So as long as we're learning from what we're doing, we're going to continue to evolve and continue to get better. Yeah. Maybe tell me a little bit about uh, using partnerships. You have your uh, Chinese suppliers. And you also brought in Softec at some point. Yep. I think a lot of smaller startups feel like they can't really use a company like Softec. They got to roll everything themselves. I mean, you tell me a little bit of background of when we came in and helped you. Sure. So um, with we'll do whatever it takes to get it done, right? Mm -hmm. And so we'll move our supply chain wherever it is. We'll, we'll work with different vendors, different partners, because our market is, is seasonal, right? We follow the school year very closely, and so we need to get things done. So um, we have our own internal team of software engineers, electrical engineers, mechanical engineers, operations staff, but sometimes you just don't have the internal human resources to do it. And so going to an outside company like Softech to do some, some lifting for us to get us past the hurdle seemed like a pretty obvious choice. Um, when you compare that to trying to hire a new person, onboard that person, getting them up to speed, you know, just saying, you know, oh, I'm a full stack software person doesn't mean that they're, they know everything about your software stack or your technology. And so um, going into working with a, a company that has people from all different angles, have seen all different types of stuff, Softech was able to say, hey, we know what you're doing. These are people who have worked on similar technology before, and they come in, they help us get through different sprints. Some projects are longer, some are shorter, but it was a great experience. And mm -hmm. it's something that we continue to think about how to augment our own workforce um, with outside companies, because I think no company survives on its own or makes it there on its own. It's all about partnerships, whether it's your vendors, your customers, your you know, your suppliers, anybody, it's, it's, you're all in this together, right? Mm -hmm. you're, there's, no, there's nothing in this world that exists to be like, I'm the only one that's gonna do this thing and, and I'm gonna do it by myself. It's just, it doesn't, doesn't exist, so. Yeah, well, how do you feel about the importance of programming for them? Just... I, I mean, I think every company is a software company, whether mm -hmm. they admit it or not. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the difference in differentiation between products at this point, because of how easily accessible um, reference designs and technology is, you, you're building hardware to run software, mm -hmm. right? I mean, you're, you're, we're a software company. We make hardware, we make a lot of our revenue off of, off of hardware, but the thing that differentiates us from our competitors and from other people in this space is ultimately gonna be the software experience, mm -hmm. especially when dealing with kids, right? We have to make our software that runs on our device, they, They've got to fail. They've got, sorry, it's got to work and not fail unexpectedly because our users are inexperienced. And then also when we're talking about user interface stuff, it's got to be intuitive. It's got to be modern. It can't be you know, long gone are the days of, you know, oh, don't worry about it. Engineer typing in commands into a, into a command prompt to make something work. No, it's got to be a modern UI UX so that kids who are constantly connected feel comfortable in these environments. So mm -hmm. software is everything. Yeah, software is eating the world. Yeah, all hardware companies have to be software companies now, right? You I mean, I, I, would, I would argue that every company is a software company. I mean, even, even your traditional, talking about my, you know, my, my dad's long retired and no longer has his air conditioning company, but you know, we're talking about uh, like air conditioning and heating companies that I've had at my house and it's like, They've got their own custom backends. They've got diagnostic tools. They've got suites so they can put people on there so they can do those jobs more efficiently. Mm -hmm. they're, like they're software companies, right? Mm -hmm. Now they might be using you know different SaaS products to help them along the way, but look, you're not doing business in the modern world unless you have a really strong understanding of software, whether mm -hmm. it's even if it's just your website or your social media hooks or whatever. Mm -hmm. It's it's here to stay and. Yeah. And that's one of the reasons FIRST is so important. Software literacy is going to be one of the biggest challenges that we face as a, as a country. Like, we need every kid learning to code when they're learning to read and write. I mean, it is going to be so core for everything moving forward. So what's next for Rev Robotics? So Rev is, uh, we're constantly evolving uh, our product lines. Our biggest... Uh, next things is we're making a lot of progress uh, moving into the classroom. So 
first is great. First is very, but it's very extracurricular. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of kids that will definitely go join a robotics team, but there's a lot of kids that won't, right? So we're trying to get robotics and, and project-based learning into the classroom so that kids that maybe wouldn't join their, their, their robotics team these same experiences. So we have um, some new curriculum that's standards aligned, that's all of our products, that's totally free, that's coming out, that teachers can adopt into their classrooms. Um, pick, they can do the whole thing or pick and choose. Um, we are expanding our footprint internationally. We're opening some international warehouses, uh, trying to make this accessible. Like I said, we have product in 180 plus countries. Mm -hmm. um, and so we're trying to, it doesn't matter how cost effective our products are. If you can't get them in regions, you can't help that region. Yeah. So we're trying to make it so that every student everywhere, whether they are in Ghana or they're in you know, Silicon Valley, has access to this technology and to this experience. Mm. And so we're doing every little bit that we can help. And some of that's product related, some of that's back end related, some of that's educational material related, but we're looking at this problem on a global scale. And so that's that's where we're going. And we're just gonna keep getting, keep going until every kid has access. That's a good mission. Well, you're making a real impact and kudos to you for your success with Rev Robotics and coming up on your 10th anniversary. Yeah. And uh, and for all the help that you're providing all these kids. Oh, and yeah, thanks, thanks for coming on the pod. Yeah, and uh, thanks for having me. And we're here today at the first World Championships talking to Andy Baker, the president of Andy Mark Inc. Yep. Thanks for coming on the show, Andy. My pleasure. Thanks, Chris. So uh, you were originally an, a mechanical engineer for Delphi. Yeah, right? yeah. And somehow you're here today. <laughs> Okay. 20 years later, right? So maybe tell me a little bit about, you know, how you got started uh, at Andy Mark. Thank you, yes. How you took the red pill. Yeah. <laughs> so I was, I was in the right place at the right time. Um, graduated college, got a job at Delphi, formerly Delco Electronics in Kokomo, Indiana. That's their headquarters. A lot of electronics for GM. That was that plant. Sat down in my, in my cubicle job, and the guy next to me was designing. He was the lead designer for the robotics team at the high school, and they were competing in this competition that they drove around on corn kernels and such. And it was the initial year of FIRST Robotics. Oh, really? I didn't join the team for a couple years. 98, I joined the team as a mentor. Um, started, uh, started really, really well, and we won the world championships the first year I was mm -hmm. on the team. Um, had some really good mentors, really good students on the team. Um, the Kokomo High School, the team, Technocats. And uh, over the next couple of years, we started publishing designs that worked for us. So if, if a design was good, and it was successful, we would publish it in the summer of the following year. So that, that communication was key to have other teams kind of learn from what worked for us. So we were a team that was successful. We had a lot of resources. We had you know, good money, good, good machine shop, whatever, good, good school kids. And um, so we would publish those designs the kids nominated me because of the, the technical communication of those designs. The kids nominated me for the Woody Flowers Award. And in 2003, I won that award. Oh, wow. So that was like the me mentor of the year, Woody Flowers Award for technical communication. I was surprised and honored. Um, so I got to be kind of famous in first because of that. People would call me up during that time also and say, we like your designs that you're publishing but we don't have access to a CNC machine. Like one guy on Oahu, Hawaii said, the only CNC machine we have here in Oahu is at a Pearl Harbor. We don't have access to it all the time. Can you just, just, sell, just sell me that thing? I just want that thing. It was a gearbox. And I said, uh, maybe, mm -hmm. yeah, maybe, maybe we can do that. So I asked some friends on the team. Mark ended up saying yes. We started Andy Mark. Mark was your co-founder? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, let me back up a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, before we started Andy Mark, um, I was looking around for jobs, looked at an opportunity maybe to take another job somewhere, some out of the state. And at the same time, my wife was, uh, had, we had, had three little girls, like small kids. And she said, eventually, 
I don't want to leave Kokomo. I want to stay here. My parents are here. Your parents are here. Let's let's raise our kids here where their grandkids are. And uh, I would like to stay here in Kokomo. I said, I would like to leave to find a new job, more neat things. And I, then I saw this opportunity happen with those phone calls and such. And uh, I said, okay, I'll stay here in Kokomo if you support me to start Andy Mark with, with Mark, because I've asked him. And she's like, wholeheartedly, unconditional, I will support you to do this. And she's thinking, yeah, right, <laughs> this isn't going anywhere. So um, we committed that. That was a really good compromise with her and I. And we committed to stay in Kokomo, raise the kids there. And uh, um, Mark agreed to come on to be my partner. And it was actually, it was, it was four of us. It was Mark and I, my wife, and Emily, Mark's wife. Emily was our accountant controller for many years. Married, was, did all of our customer service, still does it. Wow, she's still, true family business. She still helps me run the business. Mm -hmm. She runs our, all of our customer service and marketing. And uh, so it was four. It was a team of four of us. Um, we grew the business, bootstrapped it all the way. And uh, we, we, Mark retired in 2016. He was, he was a little bit older than me. And then sadly, he passed away in 2020, ALS. So rest in peace, Mark. And uh, I see you have him on yeah, there. He's right here um, in memoriam. Yeah, yeah, yeah he's, that's nice. He's he's a good man. He was he was hoping to spend time with his grandkids and uh, kind of tinker around with a bunch of stuff, and he didn't get a good chance to do that. So mm -hmm. I, I miss Mark, and um, yeah. But uh, so now it's it's really Mary and I that run the business. And you started out first mentoring teams right yeah. before you got involved, yeah. and maybe talk a little bit about how impactful that is for these kids to see both mentors that have careers and then yourself being a yeah. small business owner here at, at FIRST. FIRST is a mentor program disguised as a robotic competition. This isn't science fair. This isn't kids doing their own work all on their own. This is kids building these robots, designing these robots with professionals to compete at the highest level. It's like, it's like a a basketball player kid playing basketball with Michael Jordan. Not to that extreme, but in, in that sense. Um, so the adults are with the kids, designing, showing them what they can do. So if you're an electrician on a team and you're, you're showing a kid how to do wiring on the team, that's great, and the kid can see that. But if, if you're an entrepreneur and the kids see you as an entrepreneur, entrepreneur and they see some of your challenges and some of your, you know, some of your hectic times and some of your successes, in a way, that's 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 your way of mentoring these kids on how to be an entrepreneur. Also, mm -hmm. so first is very entrepreneurial. Each one of these teams, it's its own business. There's, it's not just kids programming a robot or designing a gear train. They're raising money. They're they're designing a logo. They're they're um, project. They're managing a project. They're they're gathering support from their administrators or. You know, it, so there's a lot of parallels with starting your own business, getting um, you know VC help or getting uh, community help for your business. So first is extremely entrepreneurial, and we as we as an man. entrepreneur, we as entrepreneurs are great mentors in first because it it lets the kids see us as an attainable role model for them to achieve to be. Yeah. And how did you get your interest in engineering? There wasn't first when we were growing up, right? Right. right. Um, my mom has uh, has two brothers. One, I have one uncle, and then my mom's brother-in-law. I have two uncles that were who were engineers, and I always thought they would tell me what they would do. I would go visit them, and they would tell me what they did. One of them worked at JPL in um, um, Pasadena, California. Jet and, Propulsion Lab. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah, and and he would he had some pretty neat projects there. Um, he ended up working on the the gravity wave project that was measuring gravity waves. They had, there's a there's um, there's a there's a measurement device in Louisiana and Washington. So he was on those projects, and he he actually passed away a couple of years before. Recently, they did finally detect gravity waves with his project. Anyway. I digress. His his work, he would tell me about it, and I was really interested. Another uncle worked for Raytheon and made um, 
like uh, guided missiles and such for Raytheon, and uh, that was pretty cool to me too. So I would um, listen to their stories and be in intrigued. And he's he's still living. And actually, at Andy Mark, we have we we have products. We have I don't know three thousand, four thousand products, and we we always have a challenge of naming our products. And one of our gearboxes is called the LJ Gearbox. And it's named after my uncle Larry Jones, mm -hmm. who passed away. And it's LJ is because my inspirational uncle. So yeah, I was inspired too as a kid, just like these kids are. Mm. And it's I was, powerful, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And you said you had three thousand products at Andy Mark, right? Yeah, that's, something that's a like lot. that. Yeah. <laughs> I, I went by your booth. I mean, it has all kinds of gears, right? And fun toys. I wanted to play around with some of that myself. So, um, did, was there anything that really prompted you to take that Red Bull, other than you know, I guess a need for staying yeah. in, in the city you were in? So more inspiration. Um, my dad. Mm -hmm. my, my dad was a a small town CPA in North Central Indiana, and uh, he was he was definitely an entrepreneur. So, mm -hmm. technical inspiration from my uncles, entrepreneurial inspiration from my dad, and my dad went out on his own and and started his own um, CPA accounting practice and did a lot of farmer accounting. He probably had about a thousand customers just in this little tiny town of Monticello, Indiana, and. Uh, like I said, I won I won this Woody Flowers Award in 2003, so I got to be a little bit famous with him first. And I would take I would take Dad to events with me, and he would he would, like we'd be running an event. I'd be on the scoring table or something. He'd go get everybody cokes or donuts, and he'd say, "This is great. Here's some cokes and donuts." And he would like he'd be like a fan to us who were doing this work. And I I kind of through knowing that he's a advisor and an accountant, I said, "Hey, I got this idea about this business." What do you think? He's like, well, first of all, they need the product. Second of all, they, they love you. And, and you're, you have a name for yourself now. So you need to capitalize on that. Tell me a little bit about the values and the mission at Andy Mark. Um, yeah, we're pretty proud of our culture and our mission. Mm -hmm. our, our mission is to create innovative products and make a positive impact in the community. Mm -hmm. um, and is that something you started from the get go? I mean, just concentrating on the values and the mission. Yeah, in our heads we did. Yeah. Um, so with Mark and I and Emily and Mary, we were all on the same page. We wanted to do good and make, make really cool products and really improve our community. Not, not just the first community, but Kokomo and Indiana. So our, our communities are lots of things. It's not just one, one community. And so once we started hiring people, I remember I, I, we were on a family trip. Mary and I were driving in our minivan to um, Cedar Point you know, in Ohio with the kids. We were going to an amusement park. And we started, we, that was right when we started hiring some staff. And I was like, how do we tell our staff what our values are? And so we wrote down our mission. We wrote down our goals. And that was probably 2007, because we started hiring people 2007, 2008. And we haven't changed that since then. So we, 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 we look to those mission and goals as our North Star, and that helps us decide. If we're stuck on an issue, and we have some, some gray area, maybe, maybe ethics or culture things we wanted to go through, and we look at that North Star as our guide, and it helps us through. So it, and I really think that the people that we hire, we really look for them to to agree to this mission and culture and, you know, doing good, making, making innovative things and being a positive impact in our community. Yeah, I think it's fantastic uh, culture to have. And I think first also encourages that with the kids, right? Yeah. I think some of the kids were telling me that, um, you know, if, uh, not, their, competitor, their competitor suddenly doesn't have a part <laughs> and they actually come over and ask them and help, ask them for the part and they will give them their part right. so that they can compete. Right? Yeah. And that <laughs> spirit of co-opetition, uh, I think, is, uh, you know, lacking in a lot of these types of, uh, well, especially like even the sporting event, right? You know, so, of course, there's the good sport act aspect of it, yep. but you don't often see where, okay, here's, here's some parts so you can beat me at this uh, event. Yeah. So, Andy, what's next for Andy, Mark? Yeah. We, like I said, we have three... We have lots of products. Mm -hmm. One of our new products we're coming out with is a, is a small robot kit. 
aimed at First Tech Challenge and it's called Robits. Mm -hmm. And this has been tested by 16 teams in Michigan. And the cool thing about Robits is it's, um, it, it lowers the barrier of entry for a student or even, a, even an adult to, who's kind of naive or, or scared about building a robot. Like they don't, maybe they have imposter syndrome about, can I build a robot? This is really simple, big hardware pieces, um, set increments of adjustability so it's not infinite adjustable. Really simple, only only limit, very limited amounts of tools. Easy to use system that lets kids and adults get get to building robots that are custom robots, not mm -hmm. just a kit, but a custom robot with a very low barrier to entry. Okay. Like I said, Robits is coming out. And, That's uh, your product, and it's like a non-first thing, right? Because you yeah. sell some non-first yeah, products. It can be. It oh. can be. I mean, you could you could you could give it as a Christmas present to a to a kid. Mm -hmm. um, you can also compete with it. You can okay. also use it um, uh, in a classroom. And so, what's the price point of something like that? Base kit, base kit, like eight hundred bucks. Okay. So it's it's kind of pricey, but it's very modular. Um, imagine like you and I are about the same age, maybe like a. A fancy erector set is okay. what we're talking about, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's 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 a nice set. Um, it'll be we're we're shooting for August okay. as a release. All right. So we we just were telling the community this weekend, and we're pretty excited about it. Oh, that's fantastic! I'll check that out. I have grandkids, so uh, ah, maybe. nice. <laughs> okay. Maybe I'll look for ordering one of those. Well, thanks, Andy, uh, and everything you're doing with First. I know it's been 20 years, and you all the mentoring you're doing, and yeah. The, uh, the parts you're supplying all these kids to build their robots, I think it's fantastic. So thanks, thanks, Chris. I, I, appreciate, I appreciate this opportunity. Sure.